Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome Magnus Nielsen to Google. I'm going to talk a little bit about Nordic food culture in general, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the book that I've written about it, the Nordic cookbook. And <coughs> Nordic food culture is kind of interesting because it doesn't really mean anything. Because the Nordic region, it's simply a geographical area. It's not a homogenous cultural region or anything like that. So there's a lot of diversity and a lot of variation within the region itself, and it's quite difficult to define. Uh, and it's actually, like, I, on these events, I try to do like a little raise of hands, because it's quite fascinating to see how people's knowledge about the region itself is. So, can, how many in here can say with certainty what the difference is between the Nordic region and Scandinavia? <laughs> so that was an unusually poor result. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> it's usually about 10%, I find it, that at least think they can do that. So, uh, Scandinavia, which is a cultural region as well as a geographical region, it's uh, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, and nothing else. And the Nordic region, it's Scandinavia plus Finland in the east, and then Åland in between Finland and Sweden in the Baltic Sea, uh, the Faroe Islands between Iceland and Scotland, and um, Iceland itself, and Greenland. So it's a much, much bigger area. And as you can imagine, there's also like a lot of diversity within you know such a vast area. So uh, the natural circumstances in you know the southeast of Finland are quite different from what you'll find in the west of Greenland. And here you have the whole region. And like as I said before, one of the things that really define it is the geographical vastness. And one thing that is uh, another defining factor. Because I often get the question about like pan-Nordic dishes, and there are no such thing as a pan-Nordic dish, something that exists everywhere. But one thing that ties all of these different countries and regions together, though, is the climate. Because regardless where you are in the region, you're going to have four distinctive seasons, of which at least one of them is going to be one where you can't really harvest anything in terms of plant foods. You know, it's going to be a, a real winter, except for maybe like a little piece of the very south of Denmark. And this thing is something that really ties the whole region together. You know, the need to produce an excess in summer and store it for winter and then consume it during the dark months. And, like, one really good example of a dish that's, it's not panoric, as I said, but it's kind of as close as you get to that, and that's really, really defined by this thing with... Um, you know, having a, a proper winter, is the open sandwich. You know, basically a slice of bread with a topping and not putting that unnecessary other slice of bread on top <laughs> that you guys do. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, and why is it so important and why is it found in the whole region then? And simply because grains, cereals, they're one of the best ways of collecting solar energy in the summer and then storing it through winter to be consumed when you don't have much solar energy. And the thing, in, thing is that if you look at a sandwich, it says so much about where it's being prepared and consumed, regardless where you do it in the world, you know. And this obviously also applies for the Nordic region. And if we start at looking at the bread, obviously these days you'll find like crisp crusted baguettes and stuff like that all over the Nordic region as much as you'll find them anywhere else. But if you look at the more traditional breads and why they make sense where they are produced, it's quite interesting. And if we start with the loaf, the loaf is a, a form of bread that you kind of have to eat relatively fresh, right? It's best eaten the same days produced or perhaps within a, a couple of days of the production date. It means that you have to bake loaves of bread on a very regular basis for them to have any chance in becoming an everyday staple. This in its turn, it means that loaves of bread as an everyday staple it can pretty much only exist where you have bakeries because no one is going to bake their own bread on an everyday basis. And bakeries, they need customers to sustain them. So if you look at the Nordic region, you have uh, basically an area from Stockholm, and then south and over Denmark, which is 
densely populated enough in a sort of longer perspective historically so that you can actually have bakeries. And the loaf of bread, at least if it's baked outside of a tin, if it's baked like in a free-form way in a, you know, in, a, in a traditional oven, it's also something that needs wheat to really function because you need a lot of gluten to shape the loaf and to make it rise. And wheat, it doesn't really grow further north than Stockholm either. So these defining, defining factors means that slices from a loaf of bread is really kind of a city occurrence in historical perspective and something you'll find in the, in the in southern parts of the central uh, parts of, uh, of the Nordics. Okay. And then if you go on and look, for example, in the north of Sweden, where I come from, um, very, very little wheat grows there and it's also scarcely populated. Uh, Jämtland, which is my region, it's the size of Denmark. It's a sixth of the surface of Sweden, and it has about, today, uh, about uh, one inhabitant per square kilometer. <laughs> so not many people. And no real cities up until like 100 years ago. Um, and here, obviously, there were no bakeries. And to use the grains that store the solar energy in summer, people had to kind of prepare them in some way. And because they couldn't buy a loaf from a baker, they baked bread themselves. Um, and because it's so labor intensive and so expensive to heat your ordinary uh, wood-fired oven, people couldn't do that very often. It was more like, you know, perhaps an annual thing. You did it once a year. And each farm would have their own big baking oven. And perhaps, you know, late November, early December, something like that, for Christmas, when all of the barley, that's the most common grain up there, was harvested and dried and prepared, you uh, started firing up the wood-fired oven, which takes like a good 24 hours to get it up to about 800 degrees of temperature. And the first thing you did, because the key there, there is to, to make as much as possible of that, you know, the big effort of heating the oven. So the first thing that people did was to make very, very thin and large flatbreads. Like, we're talking about barley dough rolled out to maybe two millimeters of thickness. Cooks really quickly. Then when you take it out of the oven, it also dries really quickly. And you can easily stack them and store them for a really long time. And uh, the way people would eat them was basically to simp simply um, uh, break off a piece, maybe put some uh, butter on it and bread and just eat it like that. Or even like crumble it up and soak it in broths and, or with some cultured milk or you know, different kind of preparations. Uh, when those first very thin flat cakes destined to be uh, dried were done cooking, uh, the oven had cooled down a little bit, and we proceed by doing soft flatbreads, which is more of a kind of annual luxury item. A uh, bit thicker, it's basically the same dough, maybe a little bit of sugar in it, a um, little bit thicker um, so that you can fold them and eat them fresh for a couple of days just after having baked um, the yearly bread. The third bread to be baked was another thing that people used to make to um, prolong the shelf life, shelf life of another ingredients, which was blood. Because this time of year, late autumn is also when people historically harvested the um, excess from their meat production in summer. And blood is very perishable, so it doesn't store well, and store well. And one way of storing it is to simply substitute the water or milk um, as a liquid in a dough with blood. Um, bake a loaf and then pretty much just dry it. And then when you want to eat it later, like in March or June or something like that, so just break off pieces and uh, simmer them in broth. And the very last thing, the one up to the right there is a, a, a blood bread, by the way. Um, and the very, very last thing that people did was also loaves, but not at all in the same way as in the southern, sort of more, more urban areas, uh, where the loaf is an everyday ingredient and consists mainly of flour, water, and a little bit of salt. Um, up here they made loaves as a really special treat, maybe like two or three of them. And as with special treats, being human, we kind of want to make them even more special. So we put everything in there that's expensive and fancy. And in historical times, obviously, that was sugar, for example, and spices. So the further north you go in the Nordic region, the sweeter and more seasoned the breads are going to be. And I remember, like, growing up, my grandma's rye loaf was basically like uh, an eggless uh, ginger sponge cake, you know, very, very sweet, <laughs> almost like a dessert, very tasty. <laughs> and obviously, like in the South, where it's an everyday thing, you don't do that at all. 
Um, and you can, you can follow this pattern all through the, um, the Nordic region and look at how people bake their bread. You know, if you go to Norway, uh, you're gonna have pretty much the same tendencies as in Denmark and Sweden, uh, with the difference that Norway, with its sort of exposed coastal climate, have much less firewood available. So they figure out more efficient ways of baking. So their flatbreads are most often gonna be baked on um, like, um, a piece of sheet iron or like a flat stone with a little fire underneath it instead of you know that huge big uh, wood fired oven. Same goes for the semi nomadic Sami population, uh, the indigenous population of northern Scandinavia, because they moved around naturally they didn't have any ovens, but they did take with them their flat stones to produce their traditional gaku flatbread. Moving on to Iceland, uh, a country with even less trees than Norway. Um, Ovens weren't really a thing at all until um, the invention and popularization of the cast iron stove, which on Iceland was most often fired with peat. And this is like late 20th century. And everyone who's seen a cast iron stove knows that the oven is not very big. You can't really do much in there, maybe one loaf of bread. Uh, what they do have on Iceland though are these sort of th thermally active and volcanic areas. And quite often next to a village on Iceland, you'll see something like this which is basically next to a hot spring where people have dug little holes in the ground. Each family, each house will have their own hole and you'll have a lid on top of it. And the idea is that in the evening, you'll go there with your rye bread dough in a bucket, and put it down into the hole, put the lid on, and then come back in the morning and you're gonna have a steamed and cooked loaf of bread. And as far as I know, this is the only example of steamed bread historically found in Europe. And now we've gone through uh, sort of the base of the sandwich, like the bread part of it. And then we can start looking at the toppings, which is another factor that says a lot about where they're consumed and it says a lot about the culture of that place. This image here is from a, a restaurant in Copenhagen called Schönemanns, which is one of the most traditional open-faced sandwich restaurants. And Denmark, you know, uh, with its position as the land connection between the Nordics and Central Europe, naturally being quite a rich trading country, uh, happens also to be very rich in terms of agriculture. And you can really see this on the sandwiches. Look at that, you know. There's no way you're even gonna be able to pick that up without it all like falling apart because there's just so much toppings. So you eat them sitting down on a plate with knife and fork. Uh, you often have them for like a kind of a, a nicer lunch. You'll have beer and you'll have aquavit, you know. So it says a lot about the richness of the country. Um, if you were to go up to where I grew up, like the sandwich would be more like what I said before, a piece of crisp flatbread with a simple layer of butter and some cheese on it, something you'd probably eat standing up after working the fields, for example. Same goes for the Sami breads. Like uh, they would have their gaku cakes with them during the workday, out herding the reindeer, uh, simply eating them as is with uh, perhaps a little bit of dried reindeer on the side. On the Faroe Islands, which is a self-governed part of Denmark, self-governed territory belonging to Denmark. Uh, they're clearly influenced by the Danes and their bread culture, so you definitely find like rye loaves and rye breads. Um, but the toppings are quite diff different and they say a lot about the Faroe Islands and their geographical position in the middle of the uh, uh, North Atlantic. Like these here, for example, they're legs of mutton. And one thing which is quite interesting with not only the Faroe Islands, but with any country in the uh, sort of northeast Atlantic region, uh, or any, any part of that, is that salt is, like in a historical perspective, a rare commodity, uh, simply because there are no trees there, so you can't really evaporate seawater in salt terms, like you would, for example, in the UK or in some northern, northern parts of Europe, like Germany. Um, and there's not enough sunshine to produce um, water from salt terms, like in Spain or France or Portugal simply by evaporating with solar, solar power. So salt, which is something that most Western palates is very tuned into um, as a way of distinguishing safe foods from foods that are gonna make you sick, is something that's really rare uh, here. And it didn't really become available until modern shipping, so we're talking like 100 years ago. Because of this, many of the traditional preservation techniques are saltless. And these legs of mutton, for example, they're simply just after uh, slaughter, hung up in a, 
latticed house close to the sea called the Yallur. And because of the uh, location of Faroe Islands in the middle of the Gulf Stream, it's a very stable uh, climate, both in terms of temperature and humidity. And these particular conditions, they um, <coughs> preserve the meat simply by creating optimum conditions for certain microbiological flora and fauna. Pretty much the same as what we do with salt in the more central parts of Europe, because the salt, what it does when you add salt to meat is that it induces lactobacillus fermentation, which produces lactic acid and preserves the meat. And the difference here in flavor uh, is quite significant because most Westerners are tuned into the very rich sort of umami flavors that lacto-fermentation gives. Whether it's cheese or olives or ham or whatever it is, it's all the same kind of indicative flavors that we like, simply because it used to mean safe food. And for me, going to the Faroe Islands, like having a piece of that, like my body tells me that this is like the worst ID ever. <laughs> You're going to die. Uh, even if you can see like 10 other people just munching away, clearly enjoying it. Uh, simply because my body never learned that this is also a safe way of preserving meats, you know. And if you don't find this on top of your sandwich on the Fair Islands, um, there's a good chance you'll find some rhubarb marmalade on it. One of the few things that grows there that you can actually turn into marmalade. There are no berries at all growing on that island. Uh, and the same actually applies for Iceland as well. Loads of rhubarb everywhere. Um, Iceland, also being a Northeastern Atlantic um, uh, culture, they, uh, they have these saltless uh, preservation methods like the Faroe Islands. Um, and with their mutton, they have a little addition and they smoke it in small smokehouses like this. And it's a sort of slow, cold smoking process. And then they also store them in the smokehouse after they're done. And they like, pick one down from the rafters uh, once a week or something like that. Um, being a country with very, very few trees, they figured out a different way of creating the smoke and heat. Um, the reason why Iceland doesn't have many trees is, you know, you have the, the, the exposed climate, um, and it's also very remote, but mostly because they have so many sheep who will eat all the saplings and produce sheep shit, which is collected and then, you know, used for fuel in the houses. <laughs> doesn't sound super appetizing, right? <laughs> so, anyhow. Uh, that's perhaps enough talking about sandwiches as a cultural marker, <laughs> even though it's very interesting, I think. I'm going to talk a little bit also about how the book was put together. And initially, I wasn't very keen on doing this project, and I was kind of offended when I was asked to do it, actually, uh, simply because most people living in the Nordic region, they don't identify themselves as Nordic, because I'm a Swede. I'm not Nordic. Uh, and most people feel the same way. And I thought it was kind of a little bit like taking, you know, Germany and some Portuguese and some French and some Italian cooking and just putting it into one book and calling it the European cookbook. Um, and it really turned me off of that idea. But, but then, you know, after um, going back and forth a little bit about this and, you know, thinking more about it, and um, I actually realized that that was the reason why the book should be written. And also that the publisher had clearly decided that the book should be written, and I didn't want anyone else to do it. Um, <coughs> but, but the fact that most people, even within the region, doesn't know what Nordic food culture is, I thought was a really good motivation. Um, and the purpose of the book is to explain this, but not just by uh, creating like uh, a very comprehensive uh, collection of recipes because that kind of already exists, and it's not very interesting, because recipes are just instruction on how to produce something. Um, I also wanted to um, provide a context. So it's about half recipes, there are 700 and something recipes, but there's also like more than 130,000 words of narrative text to explain like where the recipes come from and how they all tie together and you know why they make sense, where they were produced or where they're still produced. I really wanted the book to be a kind of a documentation of where everything comes from historically because without that you can't really understand why we eat the way we do today but I didn't want it to become you know um, like a, a romanticized fairy tale version of something either so there's a little bit of that and then there's also a big focus on what people actually eat today in the Nordic region um, 
like a snapshot of the actual food culture. And because of this, on top of those sort of ordinary gravlax and herring and sheep shit smoked mutton recipes, uh, you're going to find recipes like this one. Uh, this is a thoroughly regional specialty from Sweden, the taco quiche. <laughs> <laughs> and there was actually a lot of debate on whether recipes like this were going to be included in the book or not. Um, because, like, why is this a Swedish recipe? And it's quite interesting to look at how we define, you know, what comes from where and how we def define the identity of a dish. Um, and with these kind of more recent recipes, this was, you know, developed over the last 30 years. It's actually really easy to figure out how they developed, why, and when it all started. And then you can kind of decide whether it is Swedish or not. And with this particular recipe, um, like I know where it came from because I kind of lived when that happened, <laughs> which is not the case with most of the recipes in the book. Um, late 80s, early 90s, spice companies brought kind of the concept of the taco to Sweden. And it wasn't like a real, authentic Mexican taco, but more of a sort of bastardized Tex-Mex version uh, and you could buy like taco seasoning kits. But it became very, very popular. And uh, as with things that become popular, people start to uh, consume a lot of it. And eventually they get a little bit tired of it and they lose the kind of initial respect for it, uh, even if it's just like a taco seasoning kit. And then when, that's when the interesting stuff starts to happen because that's when people start to adapt it. You know, because this happens everywhere all the time, that we start to adapt things to, to better suit uh, the circumstances where we practice our food culture and to better suit our own palate. And this has led to dishes like this one, you know, the, the merge between uh, a Swedish minced meat pie and a taco quiche, or a taco and, you know, hence the taco quiche. And it's like, back to the discussion about what makes uh, a dish a regional specialty. If we compare this, the taco quiche, uh, with a dish that most Swedes identify as a very, very Swedish dish, the sour herring, surströmming. I don't know if anyone's heard about that. Yeah, there are a few nods. It's the world's stinkiest food. Uh, the sour herring is a fish fermented with salt. And that's not unique to Sweden. It's actually not unique to any country in the world because it's done pretty much anywhere. Um, What's unique with the sour herring, though, is that it's fermented with salt in a tin can. It produces a very particular aromatic expression. <laughs> and if we look at what they both are, so the um, Baltic herring produced in the tin can, produced in the region for sure, but so is everything on this picture as well. Like, those nachos are made in Sweden, of course. Uh, why would anyone transport them from anywhere else if you can make them on site? Same with the store-bought salsa, medium hot, um, and the taco quiche. So that's no longer uh, a defining factor in what decides sort of what is a, a regional specialty. If we look at the history, we, we, we know that the herring, one of the most iconic Swedish dishes, it needs the can to become what it is. The tin can, it wasn't popularized until late 20th century. So, you know, we can pretty much assume that the sour herring, at least as we know it, is not more than just over 100 years old. It's very, very short in a historical perspective. Um, the taco quiche, we know that it came like late 80s, early 90s, so it's about 30 years. It's also very short in a historical perspective, you know. And in 500 years, like whether it was 30 or 100 years, it's not going to matter. So those are not defining factors either. Cultural importance. With food, that's really easy to measure because you can just watch on how much people consume of it. And if you take 100 Swedes and you put them in a long row and you ask you know, about their eating habits and you ask them if they eat sour herring and how often, I would say that maybe 20 of them are going to say that, yes, I eat sour herring. And out of those 20, the vast majority is going to eat it once a year. It's going to be late summer, there's going to be midnight sun, there's going to be plenty of aquavit. Um, <laughs> if you ask the same hundred Swedes about the taco quiche, there's going to be many more than 20. And there's going to be many more of those people eating it on an everyday basis. 
So you can then this is like ask which is the most Swedish dish. And you can actually have a little look. It's easy to measure this if you just look at Google, for example, uh, and you put the Swedish name for Taco Kish in there, you're going to get 175,000 hits from a country with 9.6 million people. And I know that a Taco Kish doesn't exist anywhere else. So they're all from there. Um, you're going to get a lot of sour herring hits as well, but not so many for recipes, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, and this is actually quite interesting because you can really look at the difference between perceived reality, what we think is our food culture, and real reality, which is what we actually consume. And most of the, those, those dishes that people think is Swedish food culture or Nordic food culture, they are, but they are not very significant anymore. Uh, the most common recipe search in, from Sweden is from something called kladdkaka, means gooey chocolate cake, which is also a recent recipe. Uh, it was uh, first kind of conceived in the um, mid-70s, something like that. And you can track it from when it was first published in a magazine called Altomat until it's you know, developed into what it is today. And that has 750,000 hits. It says quite a lot about you know, food culture. <laughs> So anyhow, um, after doing research for uh, about two years, um, we had loads of material. I traveled all across the uh, region. We put up a web-based poll to ask people what they thought about their food culture and to submit recipes. Um, and it was sort of time to start compiling an index. And I did it first. I did a selection that I felt represented all the different parts of the Nordic region well. Uh, and then I sent this selection of recipes uh, or the index out to one expert in each of the separate regions or countries to review. Uh, and they came back with feedback, you know, on what was missing, what was superfluous, what was misspelled in Finnish, and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and this resulted in a kind of a, an edited down version containing 730 something recipes. Um, and I started actually producing the content. When that was done, the whole content of the book was sent out to all of these experts one more time and they got to review the actual methods and the content in the recipes themselves and send them back again. Um, next step was to copy edit the book like you do and then the final step was to send the whole book to um, a guy named Richard Telström. He's an associate professor in uh, ethnology who specializes in the meal as a cultural marker. And he reviewed the whole book and made sure that like all of the dates were in order and all that, which they weren't, obviously. <laughs> and I think one of the great challenges for me with, as a you know, food professional with writing a book like this, um, which is mainly targeted on the person who has quite uh, a limited knowledge about the um, topic of the book, regardless if you're from the Nordic region yourself or from somewhere with, uh, outside of the region, is that you have to eliminate all of the assumed knowledge. And this is really difficult. It sounds like an easy task. You know, you just have to explain how everything actually works. But it's so easy to just slip little pieces of assumed knowledge into a method. Um, and like, I tried about 400 of the recipes from the book myself in my own kitchen at home to see that they actually worked in a you know, home kitchen environment and all that. Uh, the rest of them were tried on out, out in the field when I collected the recipes. And when we had done that, we sent about 100 recipes out to different testers in different parts of the world to see, like, to, to really try to make sure that we didn't have too much assumed knowledge left. And it was quite interesting uh, to see what came back. So this is from me testing at my house, different recipes. Uh, the first one there was lutefisk. This is split pea soup. This is some spinach dishes. And then stuff like this starting coming back. Um, and this is a really good example of where I thought I had explained very, very well how it was going to be. Because this is a, something called gred torta. It's a layer cake. And all of the different parts of this, the cake, the filling, the cream, the berries, it's perfectly executed. Like, the person who tested this, she's followed the recipe in every detail. And for me, I just hadn't said how to assemble it. 
because to me it's so obvious there's only one way of doing it. So I didn't even think about that. You know, uh, and this probably tastes kind of the same, but it looks completely wrong. It looks nothing like uh, a layer cake would in the in the Nordic region. This is another one that's really interesting as well. Um, so in Swedish, this is called Chalex Mums. It's like a chocolate sponge with a chocolate glaze and some coconut shavings on top. And it turns out that here in the US, because this is an American recipe tester who tried this one, um, the round cake tins, they are 25 millimeters smaller in diameter than the Swedish ones. So the cake is almost 50% higher. <laughs> you know, like who thinks about that stuff when they write the book? Uh, this here is also, I don't know what happened here, but this is supposed to be pickled herring. <laughs> clearly, clearly there's something wrong there. So anyhow, um, that's uh, the Nordic cookbook. Thank you so much for coming and listening. Any questions? Thank you so much for coming to oh, speak Thanks for having me. And uh, I have had your food, uh, and I am very glad that you're also a great uh, writer and speaker. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask you is, um, you showed us some things that seem that are easy enough to make at home. But a lot of what you use in your own cooking has to do with cooking over fire. Yeah. Um, do you have anything to recommend for us with our tiny New York apartment kitchens and uh, fire like, regulations? Yeah. <laughs> from from exactly, we shouldn't violate those. <laughs> um, for me, like it was really important to remove uh, the way I cook professionally from producing this book because there's there's not a single recipe in this book that's actually mine. Uh, so it's just a document of what people actually cook in their homes. So what I cook at Faviken and like what was in the Faviken book, my first book, is quite different from this stuff. And I would say that out of the 730 something recipes, about 50 of them, no one is ever gonna cook. You know, <laughs> uh, They're just there to explain something. Either because they're ridiculously complicated and it takes several weeks to produce, or because you just can't get the produce. But the remaining 670 something recipes they are representative of what people, eat, uh, people actually eat on an everyday basis. And if someone can cook it in their little apartment kitchen in Stockholm or in Oslo, um, you're probably going to be able to cook it here as well, I think. They're quite accessible. So there, there are a lot of universal things uh, to, to what you talk about. Because a lot of this is very regional, but um, I would say that you can, um, I guess, when you, when you come to America, there's you, you see how we do our tacos and yeah. and all that. Uh, so is there is there something that you've learned about the sort of the universal cookbook? Yes, there's one thing that's actually really important, <laughs> and it's that there is no such thing as a recipe that works everywhere and every time. <laughs> uh, and the idea of a recipe that's bulletproof it's just flawed because it will never happen because produce is different from country to country and from time to time and you know we're working with biological material so it's really something that you have to adapt to and i think that like you have to look at the recipe and by doing so get like instruction on kind of how to proceed but then you still have to be able to assess whether something is good or not whether something is tasty or not and so on uh, and you have to allow yourself to also adapt so that it suits the circumstances where the recipe is made. And it's like, if you live in Italy, you're not going to be able to get fresh herring, for example. But you can substitute that with sardines. It's not going to be the same, um, but it's going to be tasty. And maybe that's sort of what matters. Any other questions? Yeah. I do. Thank you, Magnus. That was fascinating. Thank you. Um, I have actually the opposite question, and that is, uh, by going through this process for the last 24 or 36 months, how has that actually influenced your own cooking within your own kitchen and dish selection? It's actually, like, I didn't think it was going to influence what I do much, because I, th I thought, well, you know, it's home cooking. Um, but by doing this sort of research process and by putting the book together, I really, uh, you know, realized how much of what I already do 
that has its origins in home cooking because with no home cooking there will be no professional cooking like that's where the food culture comes from um, and there are definitely dishes today at the menu at Faviken that have you know components from this sort of research process uh, and I think that over the next years there's going to be much more coming in for sure that sort of ties into this thank you thank you Well, hi, thank you for coming. Um, in your uh, copious research, is there anything that um, you can recall uh, really, really surprising you or delighting you that you discovered? Yes. <laughs> so the most surprising thing to me, having a special interest in Nordic cooking already from the beginning and doing quite a lot of research already for the restaurant before this, um, what surprised me the most was that, you know, I thought I knew a lot about Nordic cooking when I started, and I realized like halfway through that I knew almost nothing <laughs> about the diversity that you'll have in the Nordic region, and that was really you know very fascinating to see how much there is. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a bit of a different question. Uh, I'm curious how you experience sort of food culture in a place like New York City. Um, do you, when you're, I don't know how often you come here, but when you do. Do you go to the fanciest restaurants, and or do you just stop anywhere that looks good? Just well, I think that the thing with restaurants is that the most important with any restaurant is that it kind of reflects its place, regardless where that is. And for me, for example, like running a restaurant in the countryside of northern Sweden, uh, obviously that reflects quite a lot into what we do. You know, we uh, use produce from the immediate region made simply because it makes sense. Uh, it's the best way for us to get great quality. Uh, and I think the same goes for a city. Like, you have to make as most out of the circumstances you have. And in a city, that would probably be like a very varied and big influx of produce and a huge influence from different cultures. You know, so I think that's like when I come to a place like this, that's what I like to experience um, because that's something that I don't have at home, basically. Do you have any favorite restaurants here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have so many. <laughs> um, I have, I, I come here quite often, and I have, uh, I have a lot of favorite restaurants. I'm not going to say though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as you've shown, the Nordic region is a fairly large region, and when you get to some parts of Greenland, for example, you start to get closer to Canada than and like the core of Scandinavia and same for, for the edges of Finland. So I was wondering, have you seen any interesting crossover near these uh, border areas? Yeah, you can actually see it all through the region because like the Nordic region can be divided into cultural regions. And it all has to do with like who made war with who and when, <laughs> basically, who occupied whom. And uh, the western part, the biggest part of the Nordics is clearly influenced by Denmark. Greenland, Iceland, the Faroe Islands uh, is clearly influenced by Denmark and Danish culture in a historical perspective. Um, and then the uh, kind of eastern part, which is today only Finland, is influenced by Sweden, who occupied like the whole Baltic area a long time ago. Uh, and then you have Norway kind of in the middle, which was Danish for a long time, but which was also in union with Sweden until 1890, which is quite recently. So there you can see two layers. Like you'll have a Danish base kind of mingled in with the uh, um, the regional specialties of Norway, and then stuff that happened during the 19th century, you'll have a lot of Swedish influence as well, because of the union. And you see that everywhere, like Finland, uh, you have the whole Russian culture coming into the country. Uh, Greenland, you have the Inuit culture mixing with Danish food culture. So it's really like, it happens everywhere. and. Sometimes we kind of fool ourselves that we are the first couple of generations who's been traveling a lot. Uh, but people have obviously been doing that for a really long time, and, and you can really see that uh, in the food culture. Thanks. Good. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for coming to listen to this.